Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Are you looking to plan and book an upcoming Disney vacation? Contact the Tierra Talk Show's official travel agent, James from Destinations in Florida, by visiting destinationsinflorida.com backslash tiara for a free quote. The link is also included in the show notes on our website. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, former Disney storyboard artist and animator Rebecca Rees. Welcome to the show, Rebecca. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have you on finally because, of course, we had your husband, Jerry Rees. He's been on our show two times. He was our first guest, and he's been celebrating each TR talk show anniversary with us and I just felt awful because I said you know Rebecca's done things for Disney too I really need to have her on the show so I'm so <laughs> glad we could arrange some time to talk <laughs> well that's wonderful thank you sometimes I forget about my past so it's nice to be reminded well let's talk about Brave Little Toaster because that's one of the mm-hmm. first Disney projects you got to work on with your husband of course Jerry uh, so the Brave Little Toaster 1987 you were a directing mm-hmm. animator how long was that process of, of from beginning to end to create Brave Little Toaster and release it to audiences I think it took 19 months altogether and I was on Brave Little Toaster for the production um, for uh, pre-production, production. I wasn't involved with the post-production, but I was involved. I had actually about three different jobs in pre-production. We had to create the animation for the characters. We had to kind of figure out uh, how are they going to move? What's their timing? Um, that had never been established before. So that was all done in pre-production. And I um, worked on Jerry was great. He said, which characters do you connect with the most and which ones do we want to do? And I said, um, Lampy and uh, the radio. So I kind of worked on the how they would move and their timing, and uh, we created model sheets. And so pre-production was a real fun, creative time. I liked that a lot. Production got more grueling. You know, we had definite... Uh, you know, times that we had to have things in, certain amount of footage that had to be done every week. So that that was a little more difficult. And then post-production where all the music and the rest of it's done, I was, of course, hanging around, but I wasn't involved with that. It's become like a cult classic for a lot of people who had it on VHS tape. It's one of those films that it has this wonderful fan following. It's really surprising. It really is. We We had no idea that this was going to happen. I mean, we loved the film. We all believed in it. All of us that worked on it, everyone put in. It it was truly a labor of love. And we just got a kick out of working on it the whole time. I remember working, you know, like seven days a week and up until the evenings. And I could still hear, you know, in the room with me, people, someone laughing, you know, Joe Ramp laughing or Randy or Steve Moore and, and it's like, hey, look at this. And so we were always just really believed in the movie. But, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know what people are connect with are going to connect with. You don't know. You can't predict that. You just have to do it and then put it out there. And the fact that it's retained um, so much of its charm is really wonderful um, just to hear uh, this generation um, talk about it and how much it influenced their their life and their childhood uh, is really mind-boggling. You know, my our sons, Jerry and our sons, um, Ian and Wilder, Ian is 25 and Wilder is 20. And so their friends are, so many of them are Brave Little Toaster fans. And that was so surprising when they would come over to play. And, we, you know, we had Brave Little Toaster stuff all over the place on the walls. And the kids, though, just were raised with it. It was no big deal to them. But their friends would see it and, and just 
It's like, why do you have all this brainless toaster stuff? And then they'd find out that we made the movie, and oh my God, the next time they'd visit, they'd have VHS, and they'd want you know Jerry to sign them. And <laughs> when we caught wind of, oh gosh, that's funny. We started realizing how much it was, you know, it it just touched people's hearts. So it's it's nice to know that you know when you, you've done something good for the world. I love that. And one of your next projects was Back to Neverland with uh, Walter Cronkite and Robin Williams. This was a short film for listeners who, who do not know. I really suggest listening to Jerry's interview with me. It was our first interview for the TR Talk Show. And we talk about this short film that was made for the Disney Studios, Disney's MGM Studios, about how the animation process works. And you got to animate, I think, Robin, correct? Yes, that was so much fun. I really... <laughs> that was... Some of the best animation I've, I've ever done was on Back to Neverland. I just, I mean, I was given such great material. I mean, just listening to him and watching him record, and it was really, really fun. We had a great crew. We all got along so well. And, and then going to the set and, you know, watching Jerry film. I was actually in the movie, too, which is real fun. I love that little tidbit. I'm a tour guide, and that was a completely impromptu. I went to the set just because Jerry's parents were, were there on the set. They wanted to see him shoot, and Jerry said, oh, maybe we can stick them in the background as extras. So I hung out with them because they felt a little uncomfortable. And, and then someone came up to me and said, excuse me, would you mind, you know, being a part of this because, you know, the person that was going to be, they don't, they can't do it now, and you look like you're the right size. And... So I said, sure, whatever I can do to help the production. So I went into the wardrobe department and tried it on. They did my hair and, and they showed me, you know, what I would need to do. It's not a, a, a speaking part. It was, you know, all pantomime. Um, and it's funny because they didn't know that I was Jerry's wife. <laughs> they had just pulled me out of like 500 people. It was the strangest thing. They were all so shocked when they found out afterwards. They said, you guys are married. <laughs> so we just pulled you out of the crowd. <laughs> so it was it was one of those really, really bizarre moments. If you write that into a movie, people go, oh, come on, that's not believable. That would never happen. But, you know, things like that do happen. And so it was it was a great production. I I had a ball with it. There's a photo of Robin giving you the biggest hug ever. So you, you guys were having a lot of fun backstage. Like, what were the stories going around while working with him? Oh, while well, while working with him and, and being on the set and watching, Jerry had invited us all um, to the all the animators, the whole crew. They said, "Just come on, come to the set and bring your scenes, bring your drawings." So we all brought the scenes that we were working on, and then while he was filming, he took a break, and we all got to meet him, and we flipped our scenes for him so he could see what, you know, that was amazing to him. I mean, he was like a little kid. He just cracked up and he was so happy and he signed everything that we asked him to sign. And, you know, we were snapping as many pictures as possible, but everyone was just, you know, so um, excited that most of my pictures that I took, um, they're out of focus. <laughs> blurred, overexposed, <laughs> but you know, it was, it was just being there. I still remember it. I still remember that day. It was, it was really, really fun to do that. And then I, I would go to the set also anytime Jerry would, because again, Jerry's parents wanted to, you know, see what he was doing. So I accompanied them and that was a lot of fun. You know, uh, uh, I remember Robin, he had, he had his first child and I, I think it was Zelda. I can't remember. And she had just been born, and um, he had asked, I, everyone was running around the set saying, um, he's asking, requesting if we could get something called a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle doll. And it, I'd never even heard of that before. We were all kind of laughing, like, what the heck is that? So they had just come out. They were very popular for kids. So everyone was scrambling, running around, trying to find one of those dolls for his kids. When you met Walter Cronkite, what was it like to be in his presence? Was I he met there? him but didn't speak to him. I think I was uh, just uh, awestruck. And I now, I, in retrospect, I wish I would have actually spoken to him. But it was, it was a busy time on the set, and I was there a few times, but I didn't want to interrupt things. But being in the presence of him, was, it was like being a, uh, around a history book. It really was. I mean, because I grew up with him. And um, I remember he was the news. 
Anytime you turned on TV, he was the news. Um, and to finally be there with him was uh, quite amazing. Um, but they got along so well, those two. I mean, I, I remember one time when we were on the set and um, Walter and Robin were off. You couldn't see them. They were inside of the books, sort of in between these big book props. But all we could hear was laughter. We just heard Robin and uh, Walter just laughing. And nobody knew what they were laughing about, but they were just having the best old time behind those books. And um, that was really fun. I personally think that's one of my favorite things that he's ever done for Disney, mm -hmm. right next to Genie, of course, which is yeah. well, actually my next question with, with mm -hmm. Aladdin, 1992. You're working on the story for this. And, and, I, mm -hmm. and I, know, I read that there were many script changes because once Robin Williams came in as the Genie, there were 16 hours of recording material to work with. When did you first come onto this project? Uh, I worked in, I remember I had my first son in July of 89, Ian, and then I went back to Disney um, a very short time later, actually, just within a few months, just as part-time. But I worked in development. Um, so let's see. I think it was 1990. I think it was around 1990 that I was on Aladdin, and I was in story development and storyboarding because I had worked in just development at Disney for a while, maybe about a year. And it was just in the uh, beginning stages. And Ron and John Musker, I had known them for years, and they're they the directors. Um, they were great to work with. They were real collaborative, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a fun time. I really enjoyed uh, boarding on that and working in story. And I remember when they came to my room and asked me, they said, you know, we saw Back to Neverland. And we loved Robin. They said, I, it just was so much fun. We're thinking about using him as a genie, but we want to know what he's like to work with. <laughs> so they were asking my opinion. I said, well, I didn't work with him. I said, I animated him, but I didn't work with him. I said, you, you know, you'd have to talk to Jerry about that. But I said, Jerry, I know, is that he was a, such a treat to work with. I mean, he, he never, he had this reputation of flying off the handle, and he never did. What Jerry would do is he would, um, in recording him, he'd say, okay, okay, cover the script. You know, read all your stuff and cover it. So we have that down, okay? Now you can go back and then we, you can improvise. So at least you know that you have the script covered. And then the rest of it is, you know, he can have fun with. So I told that to John and Ron, and I think they found um, that, you know, really good. And then they did talk to Jerry about his experience. And uh, after that, well, the rest is history. You know, he became the, the genie. Now, another project you got to work on, one of the last couple of Disney ones that you got to work on was Lady and the Tramp 2 Scamps Adventure in 2001, and you were a storyboard artist on this project. So were you there from the beginning for this one, too? or kind um, of I was there during the whole uh, film, but I worked mostly at home. So I would do some scenes in... You know, I would go to the Disney TV and then I would come home and, and do most of my work because I had had um, a two-year-old. So that was very difficult for me to get around too much. So the director, Daryl Rooney, was, I mean, I, we worked together for years. We worked together on Aladdin in development and we continued to work together. Uh, I met him on Brave Little Toaster. Um, so he, it was great because he gave me flexibility. And then I would go in and show scenes and then make adjustments there and then take another chunk home. Uh, that was fun because I love dogs. I love animals. Plus, I hadn't worked for a few years. And it was nice that he, you know, brought me in on the project. That was, that was cool. It goes through usually screenings before it goes out to the, to the public. And it was fun to go to the screening and take my kids and say, see, Mom does other things besides carpool and... <laughs> Because with kids, they really don't know unless you kind of point that stuff out. They're, you know, mom can do other things too, so. So you've kind of stepped away from doing animated films. You sell uh, many things on uh, Etsy as well, too. So can you tell yes, us a little I've bit? Gone in, I've gone into more fine arts now. Um, it just seemed to work with my life better. Uh, production sketches. I love animation. I love the, uh, storyboarding and writing. But production uh, deadlines are the killer. And that's really hard trying to raise a family to tell somebody, well, I can't give it to you. It's because my son was sick or I have to pick him up or 
I mean, I had to sort of make a choice at some point. And I wanted to raise my own family. I didn't want to drop them off at daycare at 7 o'clock and pick them up at 7 at night. Um, and I never regret that decision, you know, at all. Um, for me, it, it, it worked out well. Um, I do have uh, two sh- stores. I have an Etsy store, and I have another store called Red Bubble. And on Etsy, I sell original paintings, drawings and paintings, uh, a lot of different categories. One category that um, people seem to like the most is my series of bamboo, bamboo paintings. Um, and then on Redbubble, um, you can buy reproductions of my work. Um, so if you can't afford an original, then you can go to Redbubble and you can get a print or cards or posters. Or um, It's a great site. It's called Redbubble, and that's all one word, redbubble.com. I'm going to put a link in the show notes below so you can go directly to them. Thank you. You know, mostly I work in a style. It's called Sumier, and um, it's uh, like a one-stroke style of painting. Um, It's very simplistic, and it's an old, ancient um, Asian form of art. Um, But I've taken it, and I've given it my own interpretation and my own twist. I do work with color and I have sort of my own um, technique of sumier, um, and I love it. And I, I think I was influenced in all the time that I spent uh, in Taiwan working on toaster. Um, I would just loved the artwork. I brought back a couple of pieces, some paintings that I've hung in in the bedroom. And then um, a few years ago, I decided just to dig into it and uh, start experimenting with my own sumier style and. Um, it's fun, and it's very relaxing, and uh, people have been very responsive, so I'm real happy with that. And if ever there would be the right project that would come along from Disney again, maybe another Brave Little Toaster film, would you be interested in partaking in revisiting those characters and animating again? I, I would, sure. I never say no to anything, very rarely, even chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. We both we both share that. <laughs> oh, but my arms and my eyes and my creativity is always open. I'm always looking for something new and the next thing. Um, that's what's fun about um, being an artist is that you can go from, it's like a map. You can go from one place to the other, and it's always fun. The journey is 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 magnificent. That's the best part of it. But I have three more Disney questions I always mm-hmm. ask each of my guests. They're sure. called the Fab Three. So we'll start with the Donald one. So the Donald one is, as a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites? Oh, Lady and the Tramp. Yep, I still remember going to that movie. Let's see. My gosh, I was just a few years old, but I went with my brother, and I remember he would hold my hand, and we walked into the theater, and oh, I still remember seeing that and just falling in love and coming out of the theater. And, you know, I was very small. I'm still small. And just all the big people around me, but still in my mind, I still have the animation. It's it's so beautiful. It's so well done. The characters and the music, um, it's it's just charming. It is a charming film. And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Well, I know of, I, I know right away, it'd be Pinocchio. When I was at Disney, I actually got to be Pinocchio at the park for one night. And I really wow. connected with Pinocchio. <laughs> I, it was, um, a few of us got called into um, Ed Hansen's office and they said, next week is going to be employees night at Disneyland. So what they're looking for is the animation department, they said, is any of your animators um, want to be the characters at Disneyland just for the night so that the employees could get the night off and have fun. And they said there's specifics, of course, depending on your size and your shape and your weight and your, and your gender. Um, and I was like, I got to do this. <laughs> I, how many times has this happened? So... I said, I want to be one, and they kind of looked at me and said, okay, you can be Pinocchio because Pinocchio has to be a girl, and she has to be five to five, two, and I'm five feet tall. So I got to be Pinocchio for the night, and it was great. It was just really, really great. (laughs) And our Mickey question, if I asked Mm -hmm. you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? Mm, When You Wish Upon a Star. 
the lyrics to that are just amazing. And it's so true. You know, if your heart is in your dream, no request is too extreme. That's what I live by. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on the show. This has been a real treat. And I want to remind listeners to check out the show notes below because we'll have links to Rebecca's websites where you can check out some of her art pieces. And we'll have to have you on again, maybe next time with Jerry. Well, it's been terrific. This has been a lot of fun. And anytime, you just give me a call. I could even be you, Walter Cronkite. Now hold on there.